We're back on Inside Tennessee. Representative Zachary told you I'd let you tell us your priorities this session. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, we spent the last segment talking about children, so that's going to be another another aspect focus of the Republican caucus. And one of my top priorities is protecting children from the gender transition surgeries. Um, it's no secret that I drafted a letter to Vanderbilt related to the gender mutilation surgeries they were conducting on minors. I had great conversations with Vanderbilt, very constructive, um, and they agreed to put a pause on that. And the legislature. I can confidently say the legislature is going to take steps to ban that on minors. If adults choose to make that decision, that's on adults. But in terms of doing that on a minors, that's abusive. And so that's something we're going to stop. We're going to address hormone and puberty blockers. And then we're also going to look specifically at religious and conscientious objectors because I've literally had people calling my office from medical institutions where their religious and medical exemption, their religious and, and conscientious objection requests have been denied. How many does Vandy say minors that they've um, treated this way in the last year? A total of, in terms of the last year, I can't say the last year, but they told me it's been a total of six surgeries they performed on minors. I want to get to, so that will be one of your top issues. I want to get back to something Representative Johnson raised, which was um, this third grade retention sure. issue and whether the legislature will revisit this because right now two out of every three uh, children in third grade would either have to repeat that grade or endure some extra tutoring or some other issues throughout summer. Um, what, where do you resolve this? Because that seems like a lot of students to hold back. Yeah, that's, a, that's the number one issue that teachers and administrators in my district have brought to me. In the West Knoxville schools that I represent, that's been the number one issue. We actually had a uh, town hall that Susan Horn, who's our school board, school board member, she pulled together at Farragut High School and she asked me to come and that was literally the number one issue. And so there are some significant unintended consequences when we pass that legislation and so I'm confident we will be able to address that and address that quickly before uh, the end of the school year so it does not impact the two out of three that you're addressing. What do you think needs to happen, Representative Johnson? Well, it, it, it needs to be no part of the legislature's discussion. Retention is really, um, it can be an incredibly serious problem. Uh, we know that most of the research says retention is, is horrible for children. Almost all the research says that. And the reality is um, the people closest to, the, to that child need to be making those decisions. Let the teacher and the principal The teachers in the decide. schools, the principal and the parents. I mean, mm -hmm. these are the people who know the children best. The legislature should not be deciding retention because that affects the rest of your career. Dropout is higher. Suicide is higher. Uh, being in the juvenile justice uh, system is higher when you retain kids. Um, I'm not saying don't retain children, but what I'm saying is let that be a decision with the people who know that child best, not someone sitting in Nashville who's not even most likely involved in education. And the important thing to remember, too, is that when they do that, this happened in, in Mississippi, they uh, held back all the third graders who didn't pass the test. The next year they claimed a big bump in their national NEAP tests. Mm -hmm. Biggest bump ever, we're doing awesome. It's our literacy program. No, you were not testing the kids who didn't pass the test. You were only the testing the fourth graders who passed in third grade. That transparency be careful be, of the, <coughs> yes. be what So what's what the solution to that if a kid can't read? And that's, that's, right. that's right. something right. that's uh, a, a little I bit misunderstood the is the is uh, <laughs> there's some terminology here that our viewers should understand that being proficient is different than not being that's able right. to, to read. read. That's and, right. And, and, and yeah, and people really even in the legislature they confuse that. So we have we have advanced proficient, everybody gets advanced as you're doing awesome, you know. Then there's proficient. And people think that's reading on level, and it's not. Mm -hmm. Proficient is actually able to write on that same grade level. You read, you write, you manipulate the language. Approaching pro proficient is actually most of those kids read on grade level. Mm -hmm. And they're, we're cutting those, that entire group out as if they don't read on grade level, and most of them do. And so we're looking at the wrong numbers because it's politically, it, you know, it serves our political purposes. But all teachers know that those, none of those levels are reading scores. So is it changing the metric versus yeah. how we're teaching? You can't really change the metric. The only person who knows if a child can read or not is the teacher. And that test is going to just give you an idea of can they read, can they manipulate the language and write well in, on third grade level, and, and then are they advanced, are they headed into fourth or fifth grade or whatever level. So on one day. And so you fix and it by, right. well, you can't, you can't, Teach harder phonics, you know. Right. You, more. That's not the answer. The answer 
is making sure that families have Medicaid expansion, that kids are not worried about their parents being sick at home while they're at school, that we raise the wage so parents aren't working two and three jobs and they can come home at night and read with their kids. The problem is not somebody's not teaching hard enough or teaching the right thing to act like teachers are not, you know, everybody does it a little bit different. We've always used phonics. There's more of a phonics focus and that's great. But the reality is that's not the problem. We need more social workers in school. Okay. We that's, need to address those other issues. And John, if I can, just quickly, and we're talking to administrators that I have talked to, it's the us setting a parameter and basically providing flexibility within that parameter for the teachers. And so, I mean, we as the legislature set the standard and we set, we make law, that's what we do. But in terms of this, we've already taken it a step too far, so now we pull it back, we set a parameter and allow the teachers the flexibility at their discretion to be able to work within those parameters. The Susan? problem is that there's a, dis it's the, the folks who are able to do the summer programs and the tutoring are the kid uh, that are the kids that have a better shot anyway. And the disadvantage <laughs> is, those programs are harder. It, cre it widens the gap in we'll economic levels. We'll certainly see a lot more discussion on this topic. No question, question when January comes. <laughs> yeah, you want to hit to quick question because you talked about the abortion laws in Tennessee and result of the Supreme Court's decision this summer. Jason, do you see an appetite for broadening the law that we currently have? I don't. No, and Not I don't. The House, Dr. Briggs has talked about that perhaps. Are you talking about broadening or refining well, refining it, it so okay. that maybe the library get much broader, broader. Susan. Well, well so. in terms of the one the one discussion that I have been a part of was providing clarity related to IVF, and so General Scametti has already ruled on that and said this would have this this legislation has no impact on IVF. But in terms of the law unto itself, when Roe v. Wade was when Roe v. Wade the ruling went into effect over the first uh, couple of months of that ruling, over ten thousand babies have been saved here in. Tennessee before June 28th we had over a thousand abortions and in August of this year we only had 200 I mean those are actually babies lives that have been saved and so in terms of that legislation it's accomplishing the goal it is saving babies lives and it does include an exception for the mother's health and no, yes it it's an affirmative it does no, it and it's an affirmative defense but it, it does when in 2017 we passed an abort a post-abortion legislation in 2017 we passed a post-abortion legislation that also Include, included that affirmative defense and not one doctor has been brought up on charges related to an abortion because they meet the standard with their good faith medical practice. So we had a legislator on tape saying can we mine data of doctors to see who's doing it more so that we can go after them. So the reality is they haven't yet. It's only been a couple of months but they will, and, and doctors are in danger, women are in danger, and young girls are in danger. And, and we only have 20 seconds left, but uh, I want to give you, what, what do you think can change in this legislature, if anything? Well, it depends. Like, the people have to lift their voices, because certainly it's a minority to a degree, but, but the reality is it's a majority of Tennesseans that are on the side of exceptions and something different overwhelmingly 80%. All right, fact. we're, we're going to have to leave it there. We appreciate <laughs> both of your time. Thank you so much, and we'll definitely check back throughout the session. We're going to be back with our talk around with these two right after this.